Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. WTF is Remember Me. This is the first title from Don't Nod Studios, published by Capcom. And uh, it's a third-person character action game. So it's got a little bit of brawling, a little bit of platforming, and an awful lot of walking around listening to stuff. So, I did a short video on this. It was, annoyingly enough, for some inexplicable reason, restricted by an embargo. First time I've ever come across this, but apparently it's not the only time. This is something that's been happening more and more frequently. I've heard from several journalists, in fact, that the game The Last of Us was even more restricted. They actually said you can only use five 30-second video clips in your review, which is absurd and outlandish, I might add. Now I've got more time to talk about that, can I just say how disgusted I am with any company that has that kind of restriction? Now, some people can make the argument, oh, well, it's to stop spoilers and so on and so forth, or it's to stop the people that exploit the review copy to make a bunch of Let's Plays and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, if you do that, you get blacklisted from every PR agency there is anyway. Like, all you need to do to avoid spoilers is just ask the reviewer, hey, could you not include spoilers in your video? It's really not that hard. It really isn't, and yeah, it's one of the most restrictive embargoes I've ever had to work under, which as a direct result, I kind of deprioritized this game. I was like, all right, well, if that's how you're going to be, then I'm going to push it to the lower part in the priority pile, and I'm going to cover other games that are less restrictive. So just, just an FYI to the PR agencies that are responsible for that kind of thing. It's never good to hide things from a consumer. It makes them very, very suspicious. Okay. Let's have a look at the options menu, shall we? I'm going to be playing this primarily with the 360 pad because it is significantly better than using the keyboard and mouse. It's just the nature of the game, unfortunately. So just bear that in mind. If you do not have a controller, you may struggle a little bit with the controls for this game. They're not horrible, and you can adjust them, but in my opinion, it is a better game to play with the 360 pad. I'll quick look at the settings, shall we? I'm playing this on the hardest difficulty because I found all the other difficulties to be very, very easy. And the game has a lot of hand-holding in it, but at least on Memory Hunter you can cu get caught off guard just a little bit and take a little bit of damage, whereas on other difficulty levels you really can't. Video settings are pretty reasonable. They're also a bit slanty. They might want to adjust that. It's like, hey guys, <laughs> your stuff's on the side. So, super sampling. This is an interesting one, by the way. This is designed to give you a, a nice AA experience, and it is very, very heavy on the system requirements. I more than doubled my frame rate by having this off. I can have it on with my SLI graphics cards running, but just bear in mind, it doesn't improve the quality of the actual game graphics that much. But it's cool to have on if you've got a really powerful machine, but otherwise I'd turn it off. Reasonable amount of stuff here. It's a third-person game, so by default they generally don't do FOV sliders or anything like that, especially since this game is not locked over the shoulder, so it doesn't make a huge degree of sense to have an option like that. It's pretty much got what I would want from a graphics menu. Not that extensive, but pretty reasonable. Audio settings, you can adjust them separately, which is always nice. In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to knock the sound effects down just a wee bit, if you don't mind. Also, full 100% motion on that as well, instead of like just 10 blocks, which is always good. Because the music in this game is really, really good. And I'm going to keep the voice up so you can hear that as well. But the sound effects, well, less so. Voice language, I believe you can go back to the original French if you're annoyed by some of the voice acting in this game, which you might be then. Might be worth doing. Control settings will allow you to mess with the X and Y axis as well as turn off vibration, which I will because it's an annoying feature. And mess with the mouse sensitivity, which is always good. Doesn't really help the camera that much, and there are definitely some issues with that, but we'll talk about that as we get into the game. Alright, let's continue. We're going to continue on chapter 3. There are 8 chapters in the game, so I'm almost halfway through. The com average completion time for people with this game was around 9 hours, more like 10 if you spend a bit of time looking for stuff, but there isn't all that much to really find. Okay, so, welcome to Neo Paris. Neo Paris is... 
it is a silly place, let's just put it that way. It's actually one of the most interesting game worlds that I've ever seen. Unfortunately, as a direct result, it's also one of the most disappointing game worlds I've ever seen. Because this is a kind of place that I would really like to explore. The game box and the game description describes it as very much part of the game. Saying, hey, yeah, exploration is a big deal. Looking for stuff, exploring and finding different things. Unfortunately, that's actually not true. It seems to me like they would have wanted a fully explorable Neo Paris, but they just did not actually have the necessary skill or indeed the time or budget to create that. And I say that quite simply because there's actually not that much to explore whatsoever, which is a little annoying. The game is extremely linear, more so than you might expect. I dodged him. Why did he hit me? There we go. There is not an awful lot to see. Now, if you were to look at a game like, say, Bioshock Infinite, that is a game that I did criticize for being a little bit linear. There wasn't as much to explore in Infinite as there was in, say, Bioshock 1, which was unfortunate because that was, like, the thing that I enjoyed the most out of that game. However, this game has even less of that. There's actually very, very little exploration involved whatsoever in Remember Me. There are little avenues, usually dead ends, and alleyways that you can go to and they will allow you to collect various upgrades. And by various upgrades, I usually mean bigger focus bar and why, why is it even telling me that I need to do that? I don't want to do that. This, this is infuriating. I didn't want to talk about this yet, but since it's done it to me, I'm going to talk about it now. The game keeps interrupting you. This is like three to three and a half hours into it, and it's still interrupting me with BS tutorial messages, and you can't turn them off. What's even more annoying is they often happen just after checkpoints, which means you have to do them all again if for some reason you end up dying, which you can avoid by not playing on the hardest difficulty level. I mean, dying on medium is extremely difficult. It's difficult enough to die on this. Enter the sense in menu. Go to the combo lab. We're going to give you a new class of present. It's like, why now? I'm in the middle of fighting. Can you stop screwing with the rhythm of it? If you want to introduce new mechanics like that, don't do it like this in the middle of a fight. It's extremely irritating, and it's a little bit condescending, quite frankly. It's like, yeah, there's no way you could possibly figure this out for yourself. The previous fight that I was in, I just acquired a new ability, which is basically an arm cannon called the Spammer. Yes, very cyberpunk-esque. And it allows you to shoot at targets. It does a little bit of damage here and there. It's probably one of the most underwhelming gun effects I've ever seen in a game. But it lets you knock the leapers off the side of buildings. And it also has some contrived uses in terms of making platforms go away or unlocking doors and things like that. And it insisted, as soon as I got into that fight, in telling me exactly how to use it to knock leapers off walls. Ignoring the fact that it had already explained how you shoot it. That's the left bumper and then the right bumper, which is kind of annoying as well. It's not exactly intuitive. But it was just a case of, guys, I could have figured that out for myself. That You know, that's a part of the depth. That's a part of the nuance in the combat. Figuring out how to use your various abilities. But this game refuses to let you do that. It keeps insisting all the time that it shoves the use in your face. It's like, hey, hey, guys. It's like, God, just stop. Let me figure something out myself for a change. And certainly don't interrupt what I'm trying to do in order to make that happen. This isn't optional. It's like, hey, you got a new class of present. You could have done this some other time. All right, okay. So this is a chain present. Now, I should explain what this is for those of you who haven't watched the 10 minute video. This is the combo lab. Now, this is one of the most interesting looking features in the previews, but as it turns out, it's actually one of the worst things in this game because of how restrictive it actually makes the combat. So combat only consists of preset combos, and I've got currently three of them. I currently don't even have enough moves to fill my third one because you have to unlock these little present moves. They all do the same amount of damage in the same group. So power presence, you notice the different moves here. They all do the same amount of damage when put in the same place. So they don't actually have any effect whatsoever. And it's just really cosmetic as to what you can pick there. So in this case, you pick a present and then you put it in the combo chain. Yeah? And depending on what kind of present you put in there, depends on what effect it has. So this one regenerates my health, this one reduces the cooldown on my fury abilities, this one does extra damage, and this one that I've just acquired right here will actually give me a bonus to a chain attack. So I could use that, and I probably should use that. 
I'm thinking that we can maybe replace this one. No, I can't, because that's it's only a Y present, so I guess I'm doing that. Duplicates the previous present in the combo and multiplies its effect. Okay, so we're going to do that one. We're going to put it there. Seems like a pretty reasonable idea. Actually, no, let's not do that. Let's put it right at the end, so it's a, it's a big stompy one, shall we? Because it multiplies the effect of that one, so it should be an ender for a combo. So that should do a reasonable amount of damage there. Now, thankfully, this also means that I do have a couple of spare presents that I start to shove into this combo, but the combo, of course, isn't complete because I haven't unlocked enough bloody moves yet. The problem with this combo system is that these are the only three things you can actually do in the fighting. I believe you can unlock four combos in total, but that's it. If you just spam other buttons, you do barely any damage. So if you're not doing these combos, then it's pretty damn inefficient. But it gets worse because, yes, while you're doing those combos... Sounds good, but when you're in a fight with multiple enemies, what ends up happening is that you are consistently interrupted pretty much all the time. Which means that it's actually very difficult to finish the combos off and you have to consistently hit the A button to dodge attacks which are coming in your general direction. Now as you've probably noticed, the game telegraphs those attacks and you can dodge them incredibly easily, but... It's really rather annoying trying to execute a combo and having to consistently dodge everything that's coming at you and interrupting it and having to start it again. This basically means that there's only, at this point in the game, I only actually have three moves, which is not exactly great. Oh, come on, really? Now, the game's combo did, the game's difficulty did get a little bit better. It mo mostly because of the introduction of the, the so-called spammer. Okay, at least it kept my combos from last time. It puts in these enemies, which will get on the walls and then jump at you. So, honestly, you need to shoot them down like that, which is... It, it adds a little bit more variety into the combat. The problem is there's like five of these bloody things, and you don't really do any damage with that ability. So, for the most part, you just use it to actually knock them down, and that's really about it. You can kill them with it, but it requires you to mash the button, or indeed spam it. No doubt that was a deliberate choice. But at least the combat did actually get a little bit more difficult, which is more than I could say for the combat earlier in the game, which was ridiculously easy. The problem is that the game is very much trying to... I hate these guys. Very much trying to emulate the Batman Arkham Asylum, Batman Arkham City style of things, right? And that sounds like a great idea until you realize that it didn't do a very good job of it. The thing is that the combat doesn't flow anywhere near as smoothly as it does in those games. And also, you end up in a situation where you, you can't really flow from combo to combo because the enemies flat out don't let you do that. Yeah? You have to consistently be hitting the A button to a, a dodge a attack every time an enemy comes at you. And obviously, it telegraphs it with that red exclamation mark. And then obviously with these guys jumping on the side of the level, trying to knock them down time and again, it's it's tricky. And it is consistently interrupting your attacks over and over and over again in a very, very annoying way. Yeah? It's actually not that fun. It's very, very simplistic. And it seems like they tried to emulate that system, but didn't really understand what made it good. And what made it good was the free-flowing nature and the fact that the actual rhythm of the combat very much adapted to what you were doing at the time. It sounds weird, but that game deliberately didn't interrupt your combos all the time. It allowed you to get those big 4,800 hit combos and so on and so forth. It indeed even rewarded you for that, but you can't really do that in this game. Alright. Could finish this guy off. There we go. Come on. Ooh. I'm going to try and just pull off a combo just to take him down. That should do the trick. All sorted. Took a while, but there you go. As I said, the combat does definitely get a little bit more difficult in Chapter 3 onwards. Mostly, though, it's really by the application of those gimmicks and the fact that stuff climbs up the wall all the time. And you constantly have to knock it down. So, the combat in the game is sadly weak. It would, I think it would benefit, I mean, there's a few things it would benefit from. I think the biggest thing it would benefit from is the ability to hit multiple targets simultaneously. The problem is you can't do that. You don't have these big sweeping maneuvers, which will actually allow you to do that, which means that you can't interrupt the guys that are about to hit you. Yeah? The only option really is to dodge or to try and switch targets, which is difficult in and of itself. If you switch the target, it breaks the combo, which means that you can't get those really powerful 
powerful moves by the end of the combo because you are constantly trying to interrupt the attack of the person that's trying to swing at you. Either that or you dodge, which also interrupts the combo. So it's the same problem either way. Unfortunately, as well, these, these moves that you unlock don't really... They don't actually do anything differently. There's only these four different classes of move, so the choice of attack is really cosmetic more so than anything else. I mean, I just unlocked a present then that I can't even use because the only combo that I've got left there actually requires double Y button presses instead of X button presses. So it's not like you learn moves in this game and unlock different moves like you would in something like Arkham Asylum. It's like, oh yeah, I really want a move that can hit two targets right now and has a stun effect or anything like that. You know, that's the kind of thing that you would unlock in your usual character action or spectacle fighter game. And as much as I wouldn't want to class this game as a spectacle fighter, the fighting is really about spectacle because it doesn't actually have that much substance to it. So... You can see there's some clear problems there. It's almost like they tried to innovate, but they didn't really realize the effect of it and what it would have actually done. The closest comparison I can think of is to a game called God Hand on the PS2. Problem is, God Hand did it way better because each move had a very specific set of attributes, and when you chained those combos together, and when you actually built them together, you did them in a way that actually made sense and. You also had the ability to swing your head left and right and do better dodges, and everything was just generally more responsive. This game, not so much. So what else is that the game? Well, there's a lot of platforming. You haven't really had a chance to see too much of that up to this point yet. There's also an awful lot of walking around, listening, and sticking your finger in your ear. There's a huge amount of this. The game is actually laden with cutscenes and also laden with scenes where it just arbitrarily slows you down and requires you to do nothing other than press the forward button. This is a very story-driven game, but I've said this many times before. I'm a gameplay-focused gamer. I'm a mechanically-focused gamer. I prefer games that have good mechanics to games with good stories. The thing is, you can have both. And in fact, if you want to be one of the best games, then you have to have both of those things. Yeah, This is not a movie. You can't get away with having bad gameplay mechanics. The game has to be played. So as a direct result, you would be expecting the ability to enjoy the gameplay. The game consistently interrupts the gameplay, for one thing, which is extremely irritating. Has a lot of unskippable cutscenes. Now, again, those unskippable cutscenes tend to come just after the checkpoints as well, which means that you have to watch them again, which is infuriating. So combo that with the tutorials and the lengthy... Oh, you better listen to what I've got to say and you can't move at the standard speed because you've got to stick your finger in your ear for some goddamn forsaken reason. I have no idea what's going on with that. You're in an augmented reality future where information can float in front of you pretty much all the time and yet they haven't figured out a way for you to listen or have a conversation without sticking your finger in your ear and moving at about one and a half miles an hour. I mean, not only is that a WTF in terms of the actual law of the game, but it's also a, my god, this is irritating, please make it stop kind of gameplay mechanic. The kind of thing that plagued Dead Rising, for instance, one of the most annoying parts of that game. What I will say in favour of the cutscenes is that they're often very, very cool. A lot of great stuff going on with them. There's a lot of interesting cyberpunk-esque dialogue that I do like listening to simply because they use a lot of very unusual terminology. They use stuff that you generally hear about on the internet, but they apply it to real life, which is fairly unusual. It's also kind of a trope of cyberpunk. It's a, it's, I would say it's a little awkward in places, like the fact that they renamed terrorists as errorists, for instance. That's pretty irritating. There's a whole bunch of stuff like that. But it's cool. It's got a good theme to it. And the, the story of the game in general, as much as it has telegraphed, like, it's telegraphed a whole bunch of stuff. I think I've pretty much figured it out already. I'm only halfway through, but the story is pretty good. Voice acting is a mixed bag, but thankfully the main characters do sound pretty good. And overall, I am interested to see how the story goes on. But it's not just the story that I'm really interested in. In fact, it's mostly not. This is going to be a combat area, isn't it? <laughs> you can tell. You just go in here. It's like, yep, there's... There's a, a big spa space here, so we're going to be fighting something. Telegraph's that a mile away. Yep, here we go. Anyway, it's not the story that's really strong, yeah? It's the world that's really strong. It's the world that I want to explore and learn more about, because it's a really fantastic 
cyberpunk version of Paris. Yeah, that's cool. That's really, really cool. I like that a lot, and I'm glad that they actually went with that. But unfortunately, you don't get a chance to explore it, really. The, the only stuff you get to really learn about the game outside of the occasional little information drop. Oh, god damn it. This is going to be really annoying, isn't it? <laughs> invisible stuff and floodlights which turn off after five seconds. <laughs> what, are we concerned about saving energy right now? Is that how it's gonna be? Oh, I don't mind projecting huge damn holograms onto the walls, but my god, we can't have this light on for more than five seconds because who knows? Our carbon footprint would be absolutely horrendous. Come on, really? Give me a break. Alright, let's fury it up and then beat the snot out of him. Thank you very much. Activate the floodlights again for the five seconds you need to. Hopefully this is a gimmick they don't decide to use too much, because this get really annoying really fast. If the game wasn't as linear as it is, then the exploration would actually really carry it in a very big way. The problem is, it is linear. Very much so. It, it, it appears to be a kind of Assassin's Creed-esque freedom of movement thing, but you rapidly realize that is not the case. And this is no more relevant than in the platforming. <laughs> <laughs> what a perfect piece of timing for that, yeah. This is no more relevant than in the platforming. The platforming is extremely simplistic. Extremely. And it's because they point you to exactly where you need to go all the time. Those little orange arrows that appear, that is where you can platform to. There's no actual freedom of it. There's no sort of puzzle... I, mean, I don't like to call it puzzle platforming, because obviously that's something different entirely, but... There's no challenge to the platforming aside from timing. Occasionally you'll come across something that's electrocuted or say a billboard that is cycling through ads and you have to get across it before it twists around and knocks you off. But the actual platforming and figure out where to go is super linear because you can only jump to a very specific place. And then of course you got a bunch of scripted events which will take you... It's not, it's not a maze, it's a line. Yeah, the, the whole game is one gigantic line and they do try to obfuscate the fact that the game is to some degree on rails and very much restricts where you can go, but they don't do a particularly good job of it. If there was more to explore, if I wasn't just going through the motions, then I would find this way more interesting. The problem is I am going through the motions. There are plenty of story-driven games that very much allow you more freedom of movement and indeed encourage it. Usually because there's stuff to collect. Like, the reason you're exploring Bioshock is to get money and ammo, right? You're scavenging. For the most part, in Bioshock Infinite, you have way too much ammo. Same problem with the original Bioshock, actually. But if you want your upgrades and things like that, you look for money, yeah? This game doesn't have an, an economic system. There's nothing you can really buy. The only thing you're concerned about is your PMP points. And that allows you to unlock more presents and eventually get, like, an extra combo from here and there. But you can just do that through combat, and you don't really get a huge amount of it any other way. You can get extra health and extra focus, which is, you know, I mean, that's something that's definitely useful on the higher difficulty levels. In the lower difficulty levels, you don't even have to bother, because, quite frankly, you barely get hit by anything anyway. The dodge button is mostly omnipotent. You know, you've, you've got the power to dodge pretty much anything that comes at you, and all credit to it, it'll do it nice and smoothly. I like the way that you actually flip over enemies. There we go. Ah, now we can finish him off, I think. Sweet. Oh, great. This is going to be wonderful, isn't it? What? what is this? Oh, okay. I'm, I've learned something else. Right, there we go. Denial of service. Shuts down all sensors, stuns all enemies, reveals invisible ones. Okay, so uh, this again, you know, a tutorial in the middle of combat right there. It's like, and unless you do exactly what it tells you to do, it is most assuredly not going to let you proceed. So just bear that in mind. There we go. Now here's the thing, like... The game has got a lot going for it outside of the actual gameplay itself. It's the gameplay that very much lets it down. And me being gameplay focused, I obviously don't think that that's acceptable. But what I will say without question, is that the game's vis visuals are extremely impressive. I'm not just talking about graphical fidelity, I'm talking about the inventiveness, the imagination put into it. Like, they have created a very interesting looking futuristic city, and they have put augmented reality elements into it in a believable and interesting fashion. Yeah? And I like that a lot. The augmented reality parts are actually really cool. There's actually a boss fight where the entire thing 
is inside an augmented reality arena that the boss has actually created, and it's kind of part of a reality TV show. The boss fight itself kind of sucks. Like, the, it is actually a pretty terrible boss fight. The, the first two stages of it are simply dodge, 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 dodge until he charges at you and then mash a combo on him. Rinse and repeat. Yeah? And that's all it is. Not ideal. Not by any stretch of the imagination. However, the actual arena itself is pretty damn interesting. I was impressed by the arena and it's like, wow, look at the visuals here. And the problem is that that's, that's the real shame. That's the really disappointing part of the actual game itself. Looks like we're going to be doing a puzzle here. Wonderful. That's what I wanted to see. The disappointing part is that, yes, the game actually has some really cool ideas behind it. And frankly, I would love to see more of that. But we don't get that because it shows you only what it specifically wants you to see. And as a direct result, oh, Jesus, this is going to take me forever, isn't it? I don't even know what's going on here. I hate puzzles. It's like, funnily enough, this is the first puzzle I've encountered in th about three and a half hours of playing the game. I will pause the video here and I will skip the puzzle and then we'll get back to talking. Yeah, that was actually easier than I thought it was. Simply a case of making a path that you could climb up. So there you go. All right. Anyway. Overly restrictive world. Lousy combat. What's good about it, though? Aside from the world itself. Well, I think special mention has to be given to the music. The music is actually fantastic. Like, both the combat music and the regular music as well. It's a really nice mix of orchestral sweeps. There's some really generally good music that also gives nice build-ups as well. It's not just a random piece of orchestral music that was put in there. There was obviously a lot of thought put into the music and when it was used and why it was used. The combat music itself is very varied and also seems to... Not so much... It's not so much... A case of the music being in sync with the combat that's not really the case but it does give a nice sense of rhythm to it and it also the music sort of improves the better you do i don't know if it's very much res style or anything like that where it's like oh yeah you gotta have some you gotta do really really well to get the really good music but the music does tend to get interrupted it also gets quieter when you take damage and things like that so there's actually a lot to it and i think special mention should be given to how good that is Unfortunately, the, the, the third-person character action that the game is supposed to be doing is not actually that good at all. And that leads me to believe that this game would have actually been a lot better if it wasn't a third-person action game. It's an interesting choice by them. I actually feel the game would have been a lot better if it was either an RPG or some kind of point-and-click-esque game. It could be Heavy Rain-esque where it's maybe more of a QTE-based game. And I know you're thinking, why on earth are you advocating QTEs? I would advocate a QTE game that's more focused on story development and exploration over a character action game that doesn't have a very good combat system. Yeah? I would prefer the QTE in that particular situation. That's why I would prefer something like, say, Heavy Rain. It's like, yeah, Heavy Rain does not have good combat. It's all QTE-based, but it's very visceral, and when the combat does happen, which is actually fairly rare because it's mostly a game about investigation, exploration, and things, and actual conversations. When it does happen, it actually punctuates the story very nicely. Here, it's just like, the it seems to be going through the motions of saying, all right, well, we better put a combat section here to break up the rest of the game. And the combat doesn't really mean anything. You just come across a bunch of enemies, you beat the snot out of them, and then you progress to the next one. And if the combat system was very good, then we wouldn't be worried about that now, would we? But it's not. It isn't. So, what's my conclusion on Remember Me? This is never a game that I would recommend for full price, because it doesn't have enough to it. It has no replay value whatsoever. And 
if I were to talk about interesting gameplay mechanics, the only one that it's really got is the memory remix segment. Now, there are only four parts of the memory remix segment in the entire game, yeah? So there aren't really all that many of them, which is in itself fairly irritating because they're kind of the best things that the game's got going for it. And they're very much like Ghost Trick Phantom Detective for the 3DS and iOS, which is a phenomenal game, I might add. Really, really good, and I'd strongly recommend it to anybody because it is that damn fantastic. However... There's only four of them in the entire game, and they're not that advanced. The point of them is to change someone's memory so they believe something else by altering, basically rewinding a specific part of their memory, some really important event, and changing what really happened there. So obviously, it doesn't that didn't actually happen, but they believe it happened. So that's kind of the important thing there. Kind of the simplicity of the combat system in action right here. We're just like, oh yeah, let's do a combo. Oh no, never mind, he's going to attack me, so I'm going to have to dodge out of it and interrupt my combo over and over and over again. Which is damn annoying, but hey, there we go. It's just the way of the game. It's best just to mash X, really, as a result. Unless you're up against one enemy where you can really pull off the more powerful combo. If there was more of that, like, this is actually why I think the game should have been more of a Heavy Rain-esque game. Because what would happen if all, if the game was mostly about interacting with other characters, doing a few QTEs every now and again, and actually remixing memories? What if that was the main focus of the game? What if that was the main mechanic? That would have been an entirely different experience. You have more exploration, less focus on combat and platforming. Get rid of that nonsense, because it's all bad anyway. And focus on the memory remixing and then you've got something that's it's not unique because again ghost trick did it but something that's really interesting as it stands though it seems like this is a company that had a really great idea for an awesome setting with some really cool pieces of lore yeah they had a great story to tell but they didn't know how to tell it and they decided to encapsulate it in a 3d character action game which ended up being the wrong choice because they couldn't execute it properly okay the there we go Target, and it's right. Trigger. All right, okay. There we go. Sort it out. It's a real shame, actually. It's an, it is a real shame. I genuinely think it would have been better as a different genre. The game, as I said, has no real replay value. So you, you get about nine hours of gameplay out of this, and then that's really going to be about it. As a result, there's no way I can recommend this for full price because it's not mechanically strong enough to stand on its feet as a really cool nine-hour experience. Like, if it was, then it would be a different matter entirely, but it's not. It isn't. Like, it's passable at best, annoying at worst. Yeah. Overly simplistic, holds your hand pretty much all the time. And that, to me, is not enough to justify the full expense to experience the story. I would like it to be, but it's not. Yeah, that would be a lie. I'm not going to tell you that. I would certainly recommend having a look at it when it goes on sale, which it invariably will. Because at that point, it's like, all right, you know, if you paid, say, $20 for it instead of $60, then yeah, it's probably worth it. Because, yeah, okay, the mechanics are not that great. They're, they're a little bit frustrating at times, but they're for the most part passable if completely forgettable, right? So, for that price, yeah, you can justify it. For full price, no. I, I, I really wish I could tell you otherwise, because I want to support original IP. And one mention should be given to the fact that we are supporting an IP that does have a female protagonist, something that the industry has not been doing enough of lately. And I don't say that because I'm some kind of... I, not that like being a feminist apologist would be bad or anything along those lines. It's not a case of that, it's just having more interesting characters is something that gaming flat out fails to do. And if all of your characters are white males, pretty much thrown into two or three different archetypes, you're going to have a lot of boring games. So it's interesting to see a female protagonist in a game like this, especially in an original IP. It's good, you know, more of that is good because I want to see more variety in my games. It's really as simple as that. And you can tell better stories if you put more variety into them in terms of the kind of characters that you have available. And it would be a shame if Capcom and Don't Nod were to look at this and say, oh, well, female protagonists obviously don't work. I mean, that's that's nonsense. They they do. There's plenty of examples of that working, but they, maybe, they, maybe they will look at it like that. And I hope that they don't. I hope that they don't just, quite frankly, look at it as an excuse and say, oh, well, you know, the, the game was clearly great, but it's only, it's only because there was a female on the cover. That's why the male demographic didn't buy it. No, they, they probably didn't buy it because it wasn't that great. 
you know, and that's the problem. It's it's very average in many ways, and it's a lot of sort of missed opportunities and poorly executed ideas, which is a shame because this world is awesome, and I really want to see more of it in a better game. But I would be kind of surprised if they got another shot at it after this. I really would. That's a shame. It happens, though, from time to time, I'm afraid. Ideas are not enough to carry a game. Story is not enough to carry a game. Story is enough to carry a book. I mean, you can even get around bad writing as long as you've got really cool subject matter and some interesting characters, but if you have bad mechanics that frustrate the player, mm, yeah, you're probably not going to be getting away with that, I'm afraid. And that's pretty much Remember Me in a nutshell. So there you go, folks. So look at Remember Me, currently available on 360 PlayStation 3 as well as PC. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.